URL, it is case sensitive, or using um, the QR code that is below it. So I'll give you just a moment to be able to open that. That will give you the opportunity to make a copy of the slides and then you can take notes on them. You can follow, you can click on the links for the news articles that I'm going to share. So take a moment to open that up if that was something that will help you process today's presentation. All right. Just a standard disclaimer that um, please don't quote from this or uh, reproduce it in any way without my permission. And a content warning, uh, there is a brief mention of sexual assault while discussing labor practices that are involved with generative AI. So I just wanna give everybody a heads up for that. We're also gonna do a little bit of free writing later in this presentation. So if you don't already have um, a Word document up or uh, some a pen and a piece of paper, please make sure you have those things available to you. And if you also have your phone nearby, we're going to do some work with our phones later. So um, have that at hand. I'm going to read the text on these slides for individuals with sight disabilities or reading comprehension difficulties. And I want you to feel free to chat throughout this presentation. Um, I will not be able to see all of the chat, but uh, people are going to interrupt if you have questions that need answering in the middle of the presentation rather than at the end. So we will make sure that happens. I always start my presentations by saying thank you to the people who have been my teachers. And so I want to say thank you to Chris Gilead and Godney. Did I get that right? Um, Karen Costa and of course my students who are the people who teach me every single day. Here is our agenda. We are first going to uh, spend a little time with me introducing myself in a slightly different way from um, my credentials. Uh, we're going to talk about what the problems are with generative AI. We are going to talk about how landing on ethics is one way that I have sought to respond to that challenge. And the last thing we'll talk about is assessment and how we can uh, think about our assignments and our homework and all of those things um, in the age of generative AI. So I'm introducing myself. I am Kate Denial. I am a white woman with short auburn hair and tortoiseshell glasses. Today I'm wearing a blue shirt with white stripes and a red scarf. And behind me is a bright orange wall because I love color and this is my living room. I am originally from Sheffield in the north of England. If you cannot hear an accent, that's because I've lived in the United States for 30 years. And also because my dialect is so broad that even when I went to university in England, only an hour away from where I grew up, nobody understood a word I said. So I have learned to code switch and to replicate whatever I hear, which is a real problem if you get me in a room full of Texans. I am a first generation college student and this is my alma mater, the University of Nottingham in England. I came to the United States in 1994 to go to graduate school. I got my PhD in 2005 from the University of Iowa and that's a shot of the campus and Iowa City's downtown. I have worked at Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois since 2005, and I must apologize to everyone because this is the single greatest photograph of a campus that has ever been taken, and I'm sorry that your campuses are not as beautiful. <laughs> I teach Native History and the History of Women and Gender here at Knox College. I was a faculty ombudsperson for six years. I co-direct our social justice dialogues program. I love to bake and I hate to cook. The last TV show I watched was Help I Wrecked My House. I am a big HGTV fan in that it is always on in my house, a soothing background noise. I am halfway through Lauren Groff's The Vaster Wilds. I am an enormous Captain America fan. So much so that I had my students build an exhibition in our public history class about Captain America in American history. And I love to paint watercolors, to play the banjo very, very badly, and to knit. And I am very pleased to meet you. 
So let's talk about the problem with generative AI. This is a headline that I took from the Chronicle of Higher Education in the United States. Chat GPT is everywhere. Love it or hate it, academics can't ignore the already pervasive technology. So what I cannot do in this presentation is provide the magical one size fits all fix it to this situation. What I can do is suggest some different ways to approach the problem of generative AI. So generative AI generated, which I think is probably fair to call a crisis in higher education across Canada, across the United States. We feel a lot of pressure to solve the challenges presented by generative AI, but things done at speed can often lead to regret. And what instead of responding quickly, we took the time to consider the complexity of AI with our students as our partners in that venture. So ChatGPT in particular entered the arena in a very particular moment. It was during a pandemic. We are still in a pandemic and people are sick and they are burned out and they are exhausted. Many of us had to change the modality of our teaching multiple times over the past four to five years in order to keep up with the public health situation. And we were also hitting a moment where student motivations for being in higher ed are changing and we're seeing this in our classrooms in lots and lots of different ways. Um, one of them is that our students mental health is really under siege. But there are other challenges such as engagement, for example. It is very tempting to respond to this situation quickly, to ban everything or to ban nothing, to go to one extreme or the other. But I want to suggest that maybe what we need instead is to take a little time. So where do we begin? There are no reliable tools that will detect the use of ChatGPT or other generative AI programs. So we're not in a situation where we can uh, submit student work to some other AI and have it tell us whether it was generated by ChatGPT, even if that were a desirable thing. So where do we begin? We begin with trust. Our classrooms are not full of students with nefarious intentions. The research is very clear that when students use tools like ChatGPT, it is often because they are panicking because they don't have time to do the assignments that they have been asked to do. That has a lot to do with all the other things that our students are juggling, such as family life, elder care, child care, kinship relations, jobs, sickness, all kinds of things. We can also begin with transparency and we can articulate the reasons for our pedagogical choices related to generative AI in positive terms. So what I mean by that is not saying you can't use generative AI because I said so, but instead saying I think generative AI is not going to help you achieve X goal or I think if you learn to do X, you will do Y brilliantly. So rather than simply forbidding something, actually articulating what we are trying to get our students towards. So the next section is about landing on ethics. There were several things when I came to the problem of generative AI that I wanted my students to grapple with. The first were a series of labor practices that undergird the very existence of generative AI. This is a quote from uh, a piece in The Guardian in the United Kingdom. To teach Bard, Bing, or ChatGPT to recognize prompts that would generate harmful materials, algorithms must be fed examples of hate speech, violence, and sexual abuse. This means that there are humans who are then employed to go through the data that uh, generative AI has scraped from the web and remove those harmful things. This is deeply traumatizing to those human beings who tend to be very underpaid and are often located in places like Africa where their labor protections are not strong. 
Stress, low pay, minimal instructions, inconsistent tasks and tight deadlines. The sheer volume of data needed to train AI models almost necessitates a rush job and are a rec recipe for human error. That's a quote from a piece in The Atlantic that was reviewing the employment of people in the United States to respond to scraped data from generative AI. And so the pressure that people are under to do things quickly means that there will be mistakes, means that harmful material will be let through. There's also the consideration of the environment. AI needs water to generate the electricity that powers servers and water to cool them. The ethical considerations are enormous when we consider global water shortages, climate change and profit motives. And I have linked to the bottom of this slide to a piece in The Independent that goes into this in much more detail. It is a uh, it takes about a bottle of water, uh, sort of an individual sized bottle of water um, for every question and input and output that is done with generative GI, AI. Why do I keep saying GI? Sorry, everybody. I wanted my students to grapple with the question of how large language models work. So generative AI is a large language model. Chat GPT and other similar products do not generate knowledge. They simply work by means of sophisticated predictive text operations. And I linked here to a wonderful piece in Medium that goes into details about how LLMs work. It is very detailed, but it's also very approachable, and my students really reacted positively to seeing what ChatGPT does. There are also questions of access. Products like ChatGPT are rarely diagnosed with disabled users in mind, meaning whatever benefits a given LM, um, LLM might offer are inequitably distributed on our campuses. There is a wonderful piece by a disabled user that I've linked to here that is on LinkedIn about that very subject. And developers are moving to become the first in the field to offer a new thing that generative AI can do. And they are not necessarily thinking about access and whether everyone has access to LLMs. There is a wonderful piece in the Harvest Business Review that reviews many of these um, things. And then there's data mining. I want my students to know what happens to the data that they provide to generative AI systems. This includes the data that they may not know they are supplying to generative AI systems by having blogs online, by being on Tumblr, by being on Instagram, by having any text that they have put online scraped by generative AI in order to provide the database from which it then does its predictive text operations. I also want them to know what the privacy outcomes are for the, the questions that they ask, the personal information that they give to these systems. And so there is a piece here in Wired that is really informative about all of this. There is also a series of units at the University of Mary Washington's Domain of One's Own that walk students through thinking about digital privacy issues. So the question is, if I have my students grapple with all of these ethical considerations and read about, you know, water, labor practices, data mining, does it work? Does it change the way that they interact with generative AI? So that's where I want us to move into thinking about assessment and how I'm assessing my students' use. So the first thing that I did, and this term, I'm on a, in a school with a trimester system, was I had my students do reading reflections. Those were ungraded reading reflections, but they were completed after every piece of reading homework that they did for the class. So after reading each of these uh, linked pieces about generative AI, students had a series of reflections to complete. I asked the same four questions every time. What new things did you learn from the reading? 
What do you think it's important that we talk about today? What left you confused and what questions do you have? And is there anything else you want to share? That last question is always on any kind of form that I offer to my students so that there's a place for them to tell me other things that are on their mind, other things that are not addressed by my central questions. So I wanted to share some of the responses that I got from my students this particular trimester. All the names have been anonymized and I have permission from all of the students to be able to share these. And again, these were uh, reflections that were ungraded. They have absolutely no relationship to what grade they get in my class. So Wendy said, I've never heard about this before, about all the things that we talked about. Emily said, I did not know anything about this topic. Vic said, thank you for having us learn about this. I'm really glad I know about it now. And Dakota said, thank you for bringing this issue to my attention. I didn't know anything about it. So to be clear, my students knew that ChatGPT existed. Some of them had even used it, but they did not know about all the other ethical issues undergirding the use of ChatGPT. Here are some more lengthy responses to the readings. I think it's important that we go beyond the conversations about academic integrity surrounding ChatGPT to address the effects that AI is having on folks, including children in the global south, and think about why this is not a bigger part of the conversation around the ethics of AI. That was from Dakota. Jordan said, most of the time we only talk about AI in terms of academic integrity, which is important, but this information frames it in a new way. Jean said, as a society, I feel like we never care about what goes on behind closed doors. Instead, we are content with the shiny new toy and want to see what it can do and leave the rest for someone else to worry about. And Alex said, we're asking the wrong questions. Can we do this instead of should we? These were representative quotes from all of the class. There was no one in my class of 25 students this trimester who said, I don't care. Um, or who said, I'm going to use ChatGPT anyway, or any sort of response that was dismissive to the issues that they had been reading about. You may not be teaching classes of 25. You may be teaching classes of 200 students or more. So I want to point out that this kind of reflective assessment is scalable. So you can take polls. You can take the temperature of the room on issues related to generative AI and see the results in graph or pie chart form very quickly by using things like Mentimeter online if you don't have an existing poll structure that is part of your LMS. You can also have students write position statements, and these again can be ungraded. So they're things that you look at very quickly, but you don't actually have to respond to in person on the piece of paper or on the digital document that they are writing. Have students do the metacognitive work to articulate their position on generative AI. Will they use it in what ways to achieve what ends? And if they don't use it, what has shaped that decision? This is then something that you can respond to by looking at the themes that come up in those responses and taking those back to the class. So instead of responding to everybody individually, you can say, I saw a lot of people were talking about X, so let's have a conversation about X. You can take it back to the polling system and say, what is your response to this? What do you feel about this? What are you thinking about this? So I would like us to undertake an experiment right now, and this is where we're going to use our phones. I would like you to take out your phone and open up a new text. It doesn't have to be to anyone. I just want you to be able to access the predictive text function through your texting software. I would like you to write the history of yesterday 
using the predictive text on your phone. Take two minutes to do this and I will keep time for you. All right, I am going to stop sharing my screen for just a second. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, I would love to hear what some of your histories of yesterday were. Um, please feel free to um, unmute yourself and share, or you can put something in your uh, in the chat too. Um, so please, let's see what sort of histories of yesterday your predictive text came up with. Julia, thank you. The history of yesterday is a good time to get a new one for the first time in a while, and I will be able to get it done by the end of the week. <laughs> Great. What are other people's histories of yesterday? Uh, I can share mine. Mm -hmm. uh, it uh, says, yesterday we had a very nice conversation about how the world has become a more diverse place in terms of how people interact with each other and what they do differently in different cultures and ways in which they interact with each other through social media or social networks and how they communicate with people in different communities and how people are connected to different ways of doing things that we do differently in our lives in the same place. That is remarkably <laughs> coherent for predictive text. So thank you. Thank you for sharing this. Uh, Katrina says, yesterday I was in the hospital, my dad, for the second time, and he said that I had to go back to work. So I went back to work and got the vaccine, and then I got the shot today, and I was in the office for two hours. Okay. Uh, yesterday I was in the car with my mom, and she was talking to me about how she was going to be able to get a job, and I was like, oh my gosh, I just got a job. And I just got out of the car and I was so excited. These are fantastic. Anybody else want to share what they had? I do not call my mother mom, by the way. <laughs> uh, let's see, I missed Anne's. Uh, yesterday I had to take my car out of the driveway to go get it fixed because it broke and it broke down. So I'm going back and take the truck and you don't drive. So that's awesome, yes. Natalie, yesterday is the only problem with the kids and the person who is supporting my little creative process. This is wonderful. Um, I'm really enjoying a glimpse of what terminology you use often, right? Because that's what your phone is pulling from to create these little histories. Does anybody else want to share anything that they uh, that they got from doing this?
So this is a wonderful little uh, experiment to do with your students in concert with having them read about large language models. Oh, Amanda, the history of yesterday was the most interesting, interesting part of the year. And I was surprised to learn that it was not just one of those days that we have been experiencing one of those days. Absolutely. Right. Um, yesterday I had to take my mom out to dinner because I was going through the house. OK, it was about time for the universe to start showing up is an amazing phrase to come through. I agree. Beautiful. So the reason I have my students do this is to make it really concrete for them what predictive text models do. So ChatGPT does this on a larger scale. Its data bank is not just what you and your friends and colleagues regularly text back and forth. It is everything it has scraped off the web, minus the stuff that humans have taken out of the system in order to be able to make it less harmful. But this is in a simpler form exactly what ChatGPT does. And this makes it concrete. Because this is always absurd, it's often really funny. It is often really bland, right? It could apply to anyone and anything, which then means that we can have conversations with our students about, OK, so what about ChatGPT? When you ask it a question and it returns something that sounds coherent, is it actually coherent? Is it something you specifically would write for your specific situation? Is it full of generalities? Is it unintentionally hilarious in a way that might not be hilarious when you get a grade on it, right? So this opened up a wonderful conversation in my class. It was also a wonderful warm up for the beginning of class. And it's something that you can do with an online class and you can do with a class in person. So. Let me go back to my slides for just a second here. OK. My overall uh, piece of advice, and this is my piece of advice for all teaching situations everywhere all the time, is do not burn it all down. It is very, very tempting when we get to an intractable problem or something that's really giving us a lot of uh, challenges to think that if we could just start over from scratch it would be helpful but it really is that's because burning it down means an awful lot of rebuilding and it is exhausting and it is overwhelming and it is hard to do when you are juggling multiple classes at the same time it is hard to do when you have many other demands on your time beyond your job so don't burn it all down Instead, think about what is one thing you could do that would make a change to the way that your students are interacting with chat GPT or other kinds of generative AI. So I want us to do a little bit of reflection, and that's where I would love you to uh, write this by hand or write it in an app on your phone or write it in another window on the screen. But what I would love for you to do is uh, think about some of these examples I'm about to give you and then think of your own. So one of the principles that I went with this trimester was to draft and redraft all kinds of assessments in partnership with my students. So I often had my students do pieces of writing for homework. If they were going to be writing a long paper, for example, I would have them bring in the introductory paragraph or maybe a body paragraph that needed some work. We would then engage in peer review of those paragraphs, and there's lots and lots of ways to do this. The way that I did it was I gave my students colored pens and in small groups they passed their paragraphs around one another and wrote some feedback in that colored pen. You can also do it using post-it notes. You can make multiple copies of something available to students. You can share a document online. I then provided in-class time for redrafting those paragraphs. Now, this is something that can be a little sticky depending on your particular uh, discipline and how much time you feel you have. But I have decided that it is worth the in-class time to do this kind of work 
because what I'm having my students do is engage with critical thinking and writing skills that are ultimately what I want them to take away from my class no matter what. Whoops. Another thing you can do when you have longer papers or uh, someone's writing some research or a reflection or something like that is have scissors day. Scissors day is a wonderful exercise for having students think critically about their writing. You take a mostly complete or fully complete piece of work, you bring it in in hard copy, and then you have people divide it up into individual paragraphs. So they cut off the page numbers, they cut off the footnotes, they cut off the headers. So what they are left with is basically almost like a deck of cards that they can shuffle. You can also do this um, by having people isolate the paragraphs in a, a document and print them off one at a time so that then those can be shuffled too if someone doesn't have the dexterity to be able to cut things up in class. You then hand that deck of cards that has been shuffled over to someone else and their job is to put the paper back together in the way that makes sense to them. This is always revealing. In the entire time I have been teaching, which is 30 years, I have had two students whose papers got put back together the way that they had written them. What normally happens is that the person reassembling the paper finds transitions are weak. There's no strong argument that the introduction doesn't give enough signposts about where the paper is going to go. And so then we can work on all of those things. If you have a paper that has been written by ChatGPT, this exercise is going to be a nightmare in a very positive and generative way because students can see that what they have is bland, meaningless text that doesn't actually do the kinds of things that we're trying to get them to do when they write. That is useful for humanities, social sciences, longer research papers in the sciences, but if you have a different discipline, perhaps you can think about it this way. You can have students take a quiz and then have students do class review. I know that Rissa Sorensen Unruh has already visited with all of you, but this is a great idea that I got from her. When she is giving chemistry quizzes, she does not grade them immediately. Instead, the students come back to class and the whole class talks about the answers and people grade their own quiz. Crucially, they then have time in class to rework their answers because Rissa's goal is that they really grapple with the content and they learn what they need to, not that they get it right on the first try in a timed environment. Again, what we're developing with our students there are the critical thinking skills that are going to help them. It means that they get into habits of mind and action that mean that they will rely less on ChatGPT. Having them do work in class also relieves some of the pressure of time that can often lead to students engaging in um, moments of academic dishonesty. I also try to spend time with students and this can be in lots of different ways. I meet one on one with many of my students because my classes are small. Um, so I review papers with my students. I review uh, un essays. So my students do a thing where they can make anything they want to that shows me what they have learned in a trimester. So I get art and quilts and food and board games and all kinds of things. But we meet one on one to then review what they have done and talk about their experience. You may not be able to do it one on one. You can do this in small groups and move between those small groups in your classroom. If you have a large lecture theater where you can't actually easily move between groups, you can have those groups keep notes of their conversation and review those after class. You can also ask questions and design assignments to give students the opportunity to work through their thinking. So in having my students read all of those pieces about ethics, for example, 
What I'm giving them is the time and space to come to a conclusion about AI that they have said themselves they had not had before. The same is true about any kind of learning that we want them to take and to internalize. So think about how you can have your assignments really get them engaged in critical thinking, in retrieval practice, in metacognition, in thinking about how they are learning and not just what they are learning. This is especially important, I find, when my students are thinking about generative AI and people outside of our campus community are telling them, well, you're going to be replaced by generative AI, so you may as well just get used to it. Instead, what I hope that they get from the assignments that we do is that they're actually going to be better than generative AI. They're going to think more clearly and they're going to be able to communicate their ideas, their math equations, their performances in a way that generative AI could never. So back to this question, what is one thing that you could do? So take five minutes to free write and I will keep time for you.
All right, I'm going to stop sharing again. This is always my favorite part of any presentation or workshop, which is when we get to crowdsource um, our ideas. Uh, you are all engaged and thoughtful teachers. And so I would love to hear some of your ideas that you came up with during that free writing period. Again, please uh, feel free to put those in the chat or to unmute yourself and share those um, out loud. So what sort of things did you come up with? It is always hard to be the first person who breaks the silence, right? <laughs> Even if you feel like your idea is not fully formed and you're like, I have a sense that moving in this direction might be useful, that is a really worthwhile thing to share with your colleagues. Erin, I see your hand up. Well, I couldn't, I had to break the silence. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, um, I have a crazy idea and maybe it's not, it's more to get your take on it. What would happen if um, you showed an essay that ChatGPT would write on a topic that, um, so for example, a topic that you know many students are interested in and might write an essay on, and as an exercise in showing, first of all, that it's, it's not going to be referencing in the way that we like and that maybe it's very generic and bland and as a way of talking about why it's important to reference appropriately to know if the studies that were done um, were done with a similar population and so is relevant for example to the um, topic that they're interested in but I just wonder if that might open a can of worms <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that if you do that in concert with some of the other things that we talked about today, that actually can be really useful. Um, I don't ask my students to ever generate something from ChatGPT or its ilk themselves because I want to protect them from the privacy stuff, right? But I don't mind logging in on my uh, I make a burner account <laughs> and then um, log in so that there is no date. There's all right. There's minimal data associated with what I'm giving to chat GPT. But then you can have a wonderful conversation about how do you make this better? What is it not doing right? Right. What is it vague about? What is it bland about? How would they rewrite it? Right. So Look at the thesis statement. Check the citations. Can they actually find the stuff that it Ball says <laughs> it's referencing? Because often those are completely fabricated, right? So it can be a really useful exercise to do with students. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing that. Other things that people thought might be useful. Alyssa. I'm sorry, I'm having Teams issues today, so I'm not going to turn on my camera. That's fine. Um, I loved this idea of using the generative text feature on a phone. So I teach a course called the History of Future Storytelling. Mm -hmm. And next year, uh, if it's OK with you, I'd love to actually blend and borrow that. So for yes. one, of, one of the seminars, I'd love to be able to say, do this activity like talk about the history of yesterday and then what I'd like you to do is write that out or send that as an email or something and have your have the next student or a peer or a colleague build a story from there using some of the tools that we study and then pass it along again and build another story for there so there's this like awareness that the generative text like lacks imagery and it lacks plot and it lacks all these things and sort of giving them that structure to be able to I'm still working through it but this was like yeah. what I was writing down for my assignment so many many thank yous for that idea yeah I think that's a wonderful idea I love the sort of mad libs quality of it a little bit right 
especially because if they're all using their own uh, predictive text, the uh, paragraphs are going to be disjointed, right? And they're going to draw from a different set of data. So right. just as we saw in the things that people put in the chat here, some might sound coherent, but have no relationship to what came before it, right? Um, and some are just going to sound absurd and silly. So I think that's a wonderful way to build on that idea. Uh, someone else has their hand up, but I can't see who it is. Let me see if I can navigate. I am not a Teams aficionado. I, I so. think it's uh, Samranji. Yes. What's your idea? Uh, hi, uh, my name is Simran, and I just joined the webinar midway, so I'm not. Uh, I'm excited to be here, but I'm not, not sure what you covered in the beginning. Uh, but I teach the thesis course at Prague. Um, I teach at the Early Childhood Education Program, and one of the things that my students have to do is that they have to uh, write their thesis. It's an eight-month-long uh, intensive course. And um, I really wanted to use chat GPT because I knew that they were aware of it. And like you just mentioned that uh, there was also this caution that might that AI might take over our jobs. So what I did was I um, I suggested my students to um, use chat GPT to find articles for their research. So they have a topic that they're interested to uh, search research more about. So one of the things that they do is that they type what they're researching about. So ChatGPT, find me articles on this topic. And ChatGPT then gives them a list, which in my uh, experience has been quite a helpful exercise because it helps them go to the seminal authors without having to spend a lot of time on it. And then we review the results together. And I can read uh, what I think is not a good uh, research uh, paper for their uh, uh, for their topic. And that way it becomes a starting point for us to talk about that. Yes, you as a student and me as a teacher, we both know that chat GPT exists. And this is how we can use it to better our research skills. So this is what I've been doing. Yeah, so I would say two things. I mean, I, I love this idea of having students actually discuss and review what mm -hmm. they got out of that exercise, right? I would say two things. Um, one is that ChatGPT does a lot of data mining, and so mm -hmm. it might be more useful for you to generate some papers or some reference lists for them mm -hmm. to then look at in class without them doing it themselves so that they are not giving up data to ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I was going to suggest, wait, I've forgotten it. That is always the danger, right? When there's multiple things in our heads at once. I totally, it's gone. Um, so if it comes back to me, I will make sure that I follow up sure. with you and, and come back to your point. But thank you so much for sharing that with us. Sure. Um, let's see, Natalia, you said, I would do an honest discussion with students why they want to use ChatGPT or other generative AI. Maybe they use it to help them with their language skills or they're too tired with classes. Then I can change the design of a class. Also, I would give students a choice to use ChatGPT for helping them to write something, but then ask them to rewrite the same exercise in their own words and discuss how they use the version generated by ChatGPT. Maybe they use some ideas or words or maybe nothing like a learning exercise. Again, I think that's really, really key and so such a great idea. Um, having them think of it as a tool, think of uh, and that they can critique right? Empowering students to be able to see that this is not the be all and end all, and instead to be able to see that um, this is only some, this is a beginning at best, right? And that there's so much more work to do. I love your point about asking them why they might turn to it so that then you're able to take that into account as you design your class. That's a really, really wonderful idea. Other ideas that people have. Uh, 
uh, the hunches or maybe questions. Do you have questions that I could answer or others in the room could answer too? Well then, oh, Alyssa, you have your hand up. I do. Uh, thank you. Uh, that was a really great presentation. I really appreciate all the ideas because I've been thinking about uh, <laughs> how to deal with this problem uh, in my classes. And I'm curious about like how well has the creation of something like a contract or this critical reflection has been for from your sense, from students not using chat GPT. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, I struggle I, with that. <laughs> yeah, I, my, my sense is it's been really successful. Um, I have not had any work this, uh, this term that was any of the sort of, uh, that had any of the markers of uh, disengagement, I would say, right? That um, because there's nothing that can red flag chat GPT use, um, but there's certainly the kind of work that could make me go, this seems a little bland, this seems not very well thought through, those kinds of things, right? I haven't had that work. I have had much more critical and specific and thoughtful kinds of writing. And I will say that um, I spend time, I devote some time in class in the weeks leading up to major assignments for everybody to come and co-work together. Mm -hmm. So they're in the room and I can see them working and I can move around the room and see what they're working on and consult with them and ask questions and answer questions, you know. So I am giving them the space to be able to do better than turn to chat GPT. I made that move last academic year when I realized that my students were just flailing at trying to integrate all the different parts of their lives. Um, and so I decided that it was worth giving up some instructional time to do a different kind of instruction, right? It's still learning and it's still uh, critical thinking, but it isn't me at the helm, it's them working and them helping each other in many cases. Can I ask a follow-up question to that? Of course. So I get the sense that, and maybe this is wrong, but like I can imagine doing this in a small graduate class with like 20 people and students that have um, kind of thoughtfully thought mm -hmm. about this, like how purposeless it is to actually use just chat GPT <laughs> because they actually don't learn the thing that they're paying grad school fees to learn. Right. But I have a hard time imagining this um for for like an undergrad student in a first or second year elective being mm -hmm. on board mm -hmm. so all of those quotes that i showed you from this are from a 100 level course and they are from uh first and second year students so nobody in that class was uh an upper class person um and i would say that from the conversations we had none of them had really thought about chat gp chat gpt or its ilk before so they were new to thinking about it critically um what many of my colleagues had done quite understandably as i said at the beginning of the presentation was felt this urgency to move very quickly and make sort of a blanket policy about chat gpt so they weren't having these conversations with students in class and giving them the chance to develop some critical skills around this um so it does work with entry level students right and i think that giving students the opportunity to discover what they think about things is also instructional for them right mm -hmm. because chat gpt circumnavigates that process and so instead of them using writing or using their time to develop what they think and want to say right um 
it just takes that process away from them. And so it sort of really emphasized how much I wanted to hear from them. Thank you. Uh, Heather, please go see your student and thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Justine, thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much. I know we still have time, folks, uh, to to ask Kate some questions. And Kate, thank you so much for that. That was so wonderful. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, you can please yeah, unmute your mic or put in the chat. Um, and I have.